here's a rough run of show just so everyone knows what to uh, expect. And then I'm going to shut up and let the, the pros do what they do. Um, but we're actually going to hear a real sales call from a real rep, Aaron, who has joined us. Uh, so huge shout out again to you, Aaron. Um, and he's here. We're going to hear from him shortly, kind of the context on the call. Um, and we're really going to break it down to like the end of the call, the beginning of the call, and then pricing and sort of like objection handling. And then at each stage, uh, Kyle and Mark are going to give live coaching feedback, uh, drawing on their years of experience. And then the whole time, AI is going to be running in the background. Uh, and Dave Kennett uh, will essentially be the voice of AI and the replays platform and see what it comes back with. And then we're going to compare and contrast the results and see who uh, who's the winner. Um, but yeah, just to set the stage so everyone has context, I think, Kyle, why don't we flip it over to you um, and just give a super quick background on owner so people know what, you know, Aaron is actually selling on the call. So we help uh, mom and pop restaurant owners build their direct delivery business. So mom and pop owners are uh, overly reliant on the DoorDashes and Uber Eats of the world. Uh, it costs them 30 percent on every single order, which is basically unprofitable. And so they need to be able to meet the, the guest, you and I ordering food where they live, which is online. And so owner does everything that the restaurant needs to do to engage with their guests digitally. So we build the restaurant's website, uh, online ordering, email, text message, marketing, custom branded apps, um, all wrapped up in one solution done for the restaurant so they can make more money, basically. And most of our customers will double their direct delivery business after a couple months with us. So the numbers, the ROI is like pretty straightforward. Uh, it's fun to help out small businesses too. So that's a little bit about us. Oh yeah. An incredible team you've built uh, over there. And we're, we're lucky to have them in that GTM fund portfolio. Uh, Aaron, over to you for kind of just a quick setting in the stage of kind of the background on this call that people might need to know. Yeah, sure. So this is a pizza shop right outside Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, small operation, basically a one man show, except for a you know couple employees that he has. Um, they're really our ideal customer profile. Really high volume on third parties. Actually, already doing pretty well with direct online ordering, um, and just looking to take it to the next level. So great reviews. Uh, online, people love his food, um, and he was familiar with Metro Pizza, which is a big um, profile cl customer of ours. Um, so yeah, he was excited to talk. And then I had an added advantage of we kind of grew up in the same area, so we had a lot in common from the outset, uh, knowing about the Arkansas scene. So he was a really, really well. sharp guy. Like this was a good, a good call when you're talking to like a really sharp buyer. It was good. Yeah, for sure, I agree. I love it. And Dave, do you want to quickly, uh, before we get, you know, maybe a little overly critical because we're going to analyze this, um, that why don't we go to you quickly? I know AI already kind of ran this call and had a lot of positive things to say about Aaron's uh, performance. So what I want to kind of preface with those. Yeah, for sure. Aaron, I also listened to the call. Good job, man. A lot of, you got a, a lot of great strengths to bring to the table. Um, and I know owner's been using Replays IQ for a while, so this won't look different to you, Aaron, you're used to it, but for the audience, here's what AI looks like at Replays IQ when it scores Aaron's call. And to kind of set the stage, we're gonna go into you know a few different parts of the call, end of call, pricing, beginning a call, in that order. But you know we're gonna be getting, we're gonna really be focusing on the development opportunities, but I thought it was important that we just take a second to show like all the awesome stuff that you've done on here, like, you know, Replays IQ is ranking you super high on so many different things, whether it's uh, really building rapport, being super confident, coming across as the expert, being authentic, um, lots of really, really good stuff in there. Now, I won't scroll all the way down to the red stuff right now, but we'll, we'll get into that. So there's a little bit of context setting uh, for what we're about to jump into. What? Let's do this. Let's get right into it. We're going to play a few snippets. Let's start with most important part of the sales call, the end of the meeting. Uh, let's see how how Aaron does. At, does he book your next meeting? And does he actually ask for the sale? So I'm gonna actually put two audio clips together here uh, and let's just start right now. Cool, okay. So why don't we do this? Let's just set 
um, a ball to get on the calendar so that we yeah. have some sort of next step. Are you open today? I am. Okay, boom. He gets the next meeting. Nice work. Before we let's hold off on our coaching for a sec. Let's listen to the last minute of the call now. Right on. Uh, well, if you could just just send me the information we kind of talked about, uh, and we can do something on Monday. I think you said eleven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sent you a calendar invite. Let me know if you saw that come through. Uh, yeah, I got it. Yep. Okay, cool. And I'll text you a couple things as well, just link yeah. to some stuff you can check out. But um, I mean, it sounds like this is going to be a really good fit for you if we can figure out a couple technical things. Yeah, um, I agree. Okay, good. Um, okay, cool. Let me get an email out to you that just has everything lined out specifically yeah. so that you can uh, put eyes on it. And we will talk next week. Sounds good, man. Appreciate you. All right. Scott, where are we going next? Boom. Let's get uh, let's get Mark Costigo. Ah, how do you think the the end of that uh, that call? We we heard the dreaded send me the information. I think we can all we've all heard <laughs> that way too many times in our our careers. But what did you think overall? First of all, what I like is that there's plenty of time left in the call. He's not doing this with thirty seconds left, right? So that's the number one thing is. Uh, I worked with a guy named David Rubenstein. Dave always said, if you got a 30 minute meeting, last five minutes is for next steps. 60 minute meeting, last 10 minutes is for next step. So love that that was happening. The second thing though is, is um, it felt a little bit, Aaron, like you were asking for next steps, but, and he said yes, but it felt like you got a little lucky. And what I mean by that is it worked here, but I don't know it'll always work that you didn't sell why we're having the meeting. You just asked for the next step versus every time that you ask for something, it needs to create, it has some, has to have some value behind it. So, Hey, I'm going to ask for a next step, but let me tell you why this next step is so valuable for you. And so I think that that would be an area that I would see that you could probably book more next steps if you did that. But, and then another thing that I loved is checking that invite on the call. Did Hey, I just sent you an invite. Did you get it? That's a pro move, man. I love that one. That's awesome. I, I love that. I was like, Hey, we, we're getting the next step, but what are we accomplishing on that next step? So like hey, selling that, you know, quickly. Here's a good framework that I like to teach people is, Hey, can we set a next step? Uh, and what I'd like to share with you is like, Something that a lot of my buyers said afterwards helped them feel really confident about what to do next is what we did is, is we did a meeting where we go, we do X, Y, and Z, and that made people feel really comfortable and like they were getting the information they need. Does that sound like it'd be valuable to you to meet around that? That's a really good format to kind of ask for that next meeting is like, let me share with you what other buyers found useful to do next. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mark, I love when you like role play, even in this, your voice is like so calming. I like, I want to buy whatever the fuck you're, you're slanging just when you go into sales mode. I love it. Uh, um, hey, <laughs> Scott, I just did this cool training on where your voice is coming from. There's four places your voice can from, come from. One is your gut down here. One is your chest. One is your throat. And the other one is your nose. And how, where your voice comes from really determines the confidence level of the person that's listening to you or the person you're talking to. And if you consciously come down here to your gut and you end with the opposite of a lil, a lil is when you end up and like, Scott, how do you, how's your day going? And do you want to buy something? And it sounds like you're talking to a third grader versus Scott, how's your day going today? That sounds mm -hmm. confident. It sounds rooted. It sounds grounded. And so um, yeah, that's a, a, an important thing you just pointed out is talk from your gut and always end on a downward inflection, keep your tone nice and deep and your pace slow. Yeah. I love it. Someone in the chat here says the late night DJ voice, the old, uh, that's it. Chris, Chris Voss, um, Kyle, over to you. Some, some feedback, um, on your, your own team member here. So it's funny, Mark and I have never talked about th these specific topics, but we teach almost the exact same thing. I call <laughs> it gravitas and tonality, speaking from the diaphragm as opposed to speaking from your nose. And you can practice it by humming. <clears throat> hum as low as you can and feel the hum come from your diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And then hum as high as you can. And that's how you can feel it coming from your nose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's Damn. how you can get somebody to, to like yeah. feel the feeling of where the voice comes from or down here. 
I'm taking notes right now, brother. We're talking. Yeah, yeah. We're learning. That's, <laughs> that's one for you. Uh, and I very much agree with Mark's point about selling the next step in owner parlance or in me parlance. I call it, what's your offer of value? Don't set a next step, make an offer of value. And so I think that's a very sharp observation. The other thing I would add to the next step is clarifying that if we can close off some of these opening, these last concerns, that we can get a deal done. So uh, Daniel's the buyer's name, right? Uh, Brian. 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 So Brian, it sounds like a great, like what you did was end on a positive note. Sounds like a great fit it, it for X, Y, and Z reasons. It's not on this recording. Uh, but if we can tie off X, Y, and Z, you know, the open technical concerns that you talk about in the close, does it feel like this is the right call? Like that, that's your pre-close setting up your confirmation and your commitment bias for the next, for the next step and inching your way closer to that close. That would be the one thing I would add. Uh, sell the offer of value, ask the direct question. We're going to talk about asking for the business later, but ask the direct question to get that pre-close. Um, call out the uglies and figure out, like, do you really have a deal here? Uh, that would be yeah. the one other tweak I would make. <clears throat> cool. Typical ACV is like 10K for us, Sophie. Beautiful. Beautiful. All incredible, incredible advice. Uh, Dave, over to you. What's uh, What's the AI telling us? All right, Ooh, so AI Mark, time, AI time. Everybody let, take a shot, AI. Let's see if, Mark, I know you're a little nervous that AI was going to coach better than you on this call. I was a little nervous, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I get it. And the truth is you can't beat your coach and then Kyle's coaching. But what Replays IQ can do is score thousands of calls in a second, in like a minute. And that is what you're seeing right here is one call that was scored in a nanosecond. And um, let's see if it got it right. So you're talking about, specifically stating the value next steps, Replays IQ looked at that skill and set it as a 63 out of 100. And the first thing, of course, is how do you actually train a model to be accurate? Well, for anyone that's listening, this is not meant to be a Replays IQ commercial, although it's going to feel like it at times, so I apologize. But any tech you're looking at to review your calls, of course, you want to make sure that people aren't just using GPT, right? And throwing things through uh, OpenAI. It is something where you want to make sure the model's been trained for the context of the specific use case you want it for. In this case, we had a, a, a call coaching business for three and a half years where we coached top SaaS organizations, Vidyard, Outreach, uh, right up to actually IBM. And we got hundreds and hundreds of hours that we've trained our model on. And, and so you, you have to define what great looks like. So that's what we do with over 130 skills here. Uh, and this is an example of you know, what's 100, what's 75, what's 50, what's 25 on each of these skills. Just want to let, you know, the, the folks that are joining the webinar in just a little bit of behind the scenes on how do we arrive at that 63? How does Replays IQ do that? And then, the, you know, the, the thing is, so ironically or not ironically, probably not, uh, Kyle uh, and, and the owner team are customers of Replays and Mark and his former company Catalyst, customers of Replays IQ. And I think part of the reason that they, they liked it is when replays IQ marks someone as a, a 63 out of, out of 100 on something, it will go in and show you snippets, auto snippets of your counterparts doing 100 out of 100 job on that. So we all know that none of us as sales leaders have as much time as we'd like to review calls. It's just a reality, unfortunately. And that's not fair to reps, right? So the whole point is this is like a co-pilot replays IQ is. So it'll score calls, it'll auto snippet things and really show the sales rep exactly where they're at. Anyway, um, it looks like we had a similar assessment here. Now, do we also um, want to talk about asking for the business? It's probably a good time to chat about that before we get to the beginning of call and pricing. Hey, Let's hey do can it. you, Dave, can you go back to the replace thing real quick? I just want to point out a couple things. So as humans, we listen for something. And unless you have like a physical check sheet of everything that you want to assess in a call, you will, because of human nature, forget about some things that are inherently important. So if you were to go back, Dave, to that area that we were just uh, looking at, yeah, uh, you what you'll see there is, I think that replays the AI 
maybe over index the next, like the next step thing, the value state, the value, the next step, I would say that I would have probably rated a little bit lower, but it's in the ballpark. And it took like a nanosecond, not like the 20 minutes it took me to listen to this last part. But here's a second thing that it did. Look at that ROI and the pain recap. Now combine that together. And what we're finding is, is that Aaron could have recapped the pain talked about the ROI of solving that pain and use that to pitch the value of the next step. And see, that wasn't in my coaching. That wasn't in Kyle's coaching. And that's because we zeroed in on something right away and forgot the peripheral things around it. Whereas the AI never does that. It remembers everything. It's looking at all the peripherals. And to me, this is like, you know, people always ask me, Mark, hey, what's about AI? What's some game-changing tech? I got my money down on replays is one of the most game changing tech things coming down. And this is, this is why, like imagine every rep getting a call coached every day where every component of the call is getting graded and you can see how you're doing and how you're improving. And again, not the commercial, this whatever, but I have a rep that used replays and after two weeks, he was able to increase a part of his call that resulted in 18% more of his opportunities progressing in stage. He did it without his manager's help. He did it without my help. He did it all self-diagnosed and it was all consistent. And like, this is, you know, this is, you know, the webinar is built as Mark versus AI or whatever. Really it's Mark and AI. Like the AI is going to kick my ass y'all because I can't remember everything. I can't score everything. It'd take me three days to do this level of scoring on this call right? I don't have that time. And so the AI is doing it, but like, it's really important to point that out. Like I zeroed in on something, Kyle zeroed on something and we forgot the rest and the AI never forgets. It gets it. I appreciate you saying that, Mark. Thank you. And do we want to talk yeah. crucial skills here for talking ROI and sort of the value of AI? Yeah, let's do it. I think, <clears throat> so we're talking end of calls here and a lot of sales leaders, if you ask them, me included, What's the most important part of a call? If you could have a rep nail one thing for the biggest impact, what would it be? We'd almost all say discovery. Oh, it's got to be discovery. It's got to be finding the pain. That's like what we're trained and bred to believe. And when we did this analysis with replays last year, around this time, what replays told us was that our most crucial skills, so the skills most highly correlated with success, and we have a lot of one call closes, so, so understanding uh, wins and losses is really easy in an SMB environment. Um, what Replace told us was actually the crucial skill is not discovery, which was sort of made me sad for a little bit. It was all end of call. <clears throat> how did you ask for the deal? How was present? How was pricing presented? How did you set the next steps? Did you did you clearly articulate the value of the next steps? <clears throat> and so what AI can do, which I find personally most valuable, is take. Um, anecdote and opinion out of it and apply data. So I was on the cusp of building like a big discovery training program. We did this assessment with Dave. I was very skeptical at first. Uh, Dave knows this. And the results back telling me something completely different than I would have anticipated was really interesting because it made me reconsider something foundational about my business. We built an, we said, okay, let's follow the data. Hopefully the data's right. Um, and we did a 10 week end of call training program on a few different topics. And we moved win rates from 38% to 53%. That's when I was in, I was like, all right, like Dave, I'll pay whatever you want me to pay. Like, let's, let's do this thing. It's, it's the AI is it's great because it's self-serve for the rep, but also for me as a leader, the most impactful thing is now I'm making decisions off of real truth or as close to the truth as you can versus discovery is really important. I've been told that a million times. So let's do training on discovery. Mm -hmm. You know, I went from, we would do a film session once a week with my team where we might go one, maybe two calls. We get the whole team together. Now every rep is getting five calls per week coached that they can go in and look at and get uh, uh, stuff from. It's just a max it's, it's an order of magnitude greater amount of coaching. And if you look at, especially young reps and millennials, the number one thing that they say that they want out of their leadership is coaching. And this is how you can provide that without turning your entire job into just listening to calls all the time. And, you know, listen, I don't want to bang on gong or anything, but like, this is the unfulfilled promise of gong, like gong 
is just, you got to go listen to the calls. Do you want your leaders and managers listening to calls or do you want them in calls where they can actually do stuff? And guess what? If they're, if they're listening to gong calls all the time, they're not in calls with their reps. And I would argue that's a more valuable activity. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to jump in because we've got a couple of great, uh, great questions here. Um, and the first one, uh, Dave, maybe you can answer this one. Um, question is, can you sort this by false positives or negatives of non-ICP customers? Uh, you know, question behind the question, you know, if you're reviewing all these calls and there's a bunch of like negative ones, uh, how are you kind of parsing those out and making sure that you're not getting false, uh, false positives? We have a call selection algorithm that took us a long, long time to get right. And what happens is we pair into your call recording tool via API and our system will pattern match which calls we select based on a deal stage that you've got um, in your call recording tool or CRM, and then B length of call as along with a few other heuristics. Um, we also have a human QA catch all on the back because the truth is for whoever asked the question, probably also thinking like, okay, that's great, but machines aren't perfect. And if you are thinking that you're absolutely right. Uh, so we've got, we've got a human component in the back end where we engage with our customers. We're like, Hey, here are the calls we selected. Want to put your eyes on this real quick. Uh, so we, we've got uh, sort of an, um, a good QA process in place there. Yeah. Great. And then the, the last question, then we'll, we'll move on is more around just getting your teams bought into a coaching culture. And Mark, I know you jumped in and I had some thoughts, but the question is outside of the fact that reps should be doing game tape reviews, what's your advice on getting more team buy-in outside of saying, look what so-and-so achieved after doing this? Like Kyle, maybe I'll bring that to you because I know you've done a great job of building like a, a culture that celebrates, you know, coaching and improvement. Don't hire them. <laughs> that was my yeah, like, <laughs> coachability is a huge part of my hiring criteria tell me about what you're working on right now how you're getting better i can't i can't convince you of that honestly like if you don't want to get better i don't really have time for that uh so that is the real answer yeah you can do stuff at the margin to you know spotlight examples of where it's gone well and and share that with the team but fundamentally, if you don't have people that really have a desire to get better and and, and love getting coached, it's going to be real. You're going to have a hard time. I, I would take somebody with way less experience and pedigree that has a way higher learning engine and desire than somebody with more experience. Yeah. 100%, like 100% aligned on that. Yeah. Well, you can imagine a future where you have these like, you know, AI assistants that are coaching you like replays, you could have like zero experience. And if you're doing this every day versus a rep that might have three years experience that is just doing the same thing, like that incremental improvement of this rep is going to surpass them so unbelievably fast. Um, if you want to read a real long post on this topic, I got one in the hopper that's coming out this week about the, about that exact topic. Yeah. Incremental gains, baby. All right, let's go. Uh, now, you know, what everyone has always said is the most important part uh, is kind of setting the tone right at the, the beginning uh, and kind of uh, doing some some discovery. So let's uh, cue that up next, uh, Dave. All right, this one will just be an audio file that we're going to play. And it's uh, just a portion of the beginning of the call. Here we go. Um, oh, cool. Thanks for hopping on. Braden, you were talking to Braden. I yeah. think uh, yesterday or day before. Yesterday, last night. Okay, he had mentioned that you were super familiar with like Metro Pizza. Is that right? Uh, I know I've met John in passing, but I've been following his place for a very, very long time. But I saw. Okay, right, cool. I saw that the ads, and you'll have a picture of him in your ads. Uh, like, cool. If he uses you, clearly y'all are doing something right for him. Uh, so I figured out it was learn about what you do specifically that way you can see if it's a good fit for my business yeah sure thing yeah that, that's a really interesting partnership because you know we talked to them for a all right so i'm going to stop it there and i know we'll be going to mark and kyle for feedback aaron we haven't asked you your thoughts yet but i'll ask you to set this up a bit because um everyone else will notice that the beginning of the call didn't didn't someone was missing uh maybe you want to talk a little bit about that before we jump in on that and the agenda yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So sometimes what will happen with me personally, if I have a very engaged prospect who shows up and ready to talk and we're doing some rapport building, 
I definitely, I think it's easy to, to lose control might be a strong term to you to, to use, but we kind of just hopped right into it. And so we skipped an agenda because we were getting along, like we were from the same area. And then we just kind of started talking about his business and why he was on the call. So um, I didn't pull it back in to, to grab an agenda and, and uh, lay out how the call was going to go at that point. I was too excited. Hey, I'm curious, Aaron, like, so you've listened to the call. I'm sure you, you, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you've volunteered for this torture session and you know, that's super awesome. Shows a lot about what kind of rep you are and person you are. What do you think was the negative of not doing it? You didn't do it. Like, do you think it screwed you up along the way? Like what, what, the, what happened? Cause you didn't do it. I mean, I'm not sure. I, I'm open to feedback on that. For me, like in the moment, human to human, it felt natural to just keep it going. Um, I think sometimes, and it, when we've looked at other um, areas of the call, like sometimes I think reps will tend to like try to force discovery instead of just like addressing the conversation that's happening right there and try to like go to something we want to talk about. So for this one, I was just kind of flowing naturally and and vibing with the guy and just kind of let it let it take off. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if I would have pulled it back and, and set the agenda better and then took it from there if, if we would have had a different outcome at the end of the call. But um, yeah, I just went with my feeling on this one. So, Which makes sense. I feel like there is always going to be an art and a science to sales, you know, and you kind of went with the, the art component of this and you went with what felt right. And sometimes forcing things isn't the, the way to go. Uh, but Kyle, over to you for some feedback on that that first little bit. Did it, you know, as a a, a sales leader at owners, does it bother you that you didn't get that hard agenda up front? Well, nothing bothers me. But yeah, I would prefer. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer my. Uh, I'll answer Mark's question. Um, what's the negative impact of not setting setting an agenda? Well, generally, if your customer doesn't feel like you're in control, especially selling to business owners, they will feel like they need to be in control. And they'll start to dictate where you're going. And so that the part of the reason to set an agenda is to establish these are the topics in this order. I know you have questions about X, Y, and Z, which we're going to cover. And then the prospect is much more willing to follow your lead because somebody's got to be in charge. And if, and if you're not, then they will feel the need to be, especially if you're selling to an executive or a business owner like we do. Um, and then if you listen to more of the call, the customer does lead us more than uh, we would like. So in our scripting, uh, it says, uh, so in terms of the call today, we're going to cover X, Y, and Z. Uh, this is how sort of the architecture is going to go. Is there anything else that you want to make sure that we cover today so that they feel like uh, they, they have a part to play in setting the agenda? We know what they really want to get covered so we can add it. Um, and then you'll get more, uh, followership from your customer. So that, that'd be like the, the reason that even when the call is flowing to still set an agenda, you just, you're, you're going to get sidetracked probably if the customer feels like there's nobody in control. Um, so I certainly agree with that feedback, set an agenda, and then always ask like, what else to, what else do you really want to make sure we cover that? That's the one other piece of, uh, feedback we want to know you know if we can ask what caught your eye about jumping on today and like what are the burning questions to answer because oftentimes it's like very indicative of what where we need to spend a little bit more time so those would be the two big things yeah i would i would say so first of all aaron i, I like that you are cognizant and aware of the conversation the conversation is key right and so the, to say, hey, listen, this is going good enough. Not sure if I need to share an agenda, I think is a strong instinct as a seller. So I love that you're like thinking in the moment on that. Uh, I would also share though, that the reason that a lot of people skip agendas is because they're boring and stupid. All right, well, we're going to do introductions first. Then I'm going to ask you some questions. And then after that, we're going to reserve some time for, uh, for some next steps. And if we have time, I'll show you a little bit of demo. How does that sound, Aaron? Does that sound like a good call for you? That's a bullshit agenda, y'all. Like, that's stupid, right? What you need to do is you need to change the agenda to a whiff them and a whiff -a. Uh, What's in it for me and what's in it for them, all right? In this call, this is what I'm after because I want you to know I'm after something in this call and I'm not trying to hide it. And this is what's in it for you in this call if we do it. And if both of us achieve those things, this is what we're going to do next. 
And I think what it does is it just gets people mentally prepared for that next step ask at the end. So for example, hey, uh, I can't remember the guy's name. Hey, Bob, uh, listen, in this call today, I just want to let you know, I'm going to try to figure out if you have the things that make you a good fit for owner.com. I'm really good at it and I don't want to waste your time. And in 20 minutes, if it ain't working, I'll just tell you, you get off. What's in it for you though, is you might see some other stuff that's really interesting to you that other restaurant owners like you are doing inside of our platform that might spur some creative ideas. If we both get that done, is it cool if we set up another meeting in a week or you know, actually don't do a week, that's a bad practice. Is it, is it cool if we set up another meeting later today or tomorrow to kind of work on like how that might look for us as we move forward? And then when you get that upfront contract and you kind of go through it, but like, that's what I would, uh, that's what I like is an agenda where you talk about what's in it for the buyer or the, the prospect, what's in it for you as a seller. And if we achieve those two things, what are we going to agree to do next? And versus like the little bulleted list that where the slide says agenda at the top and everybody's starting to fall asleep already. I'm, I don't know about everyone else, but I think we need the uh, Mark and Kyle podcast. These guys are just <laughs> pros right here. I think I think this is the new new. You guys just do your thing on that on these. Let's uh, go over to to AI. Let's uh, let's see what we got. All right. So a couple of things. First of all, AI is saying fantastic job in terms of uncovering the trigger for the meeting, building trust, doing a good level set, referring to you know prospects hate it and, and they should. When you're on a second call with a, a new rep, you're talking to an SDR and that new rep makes you rehash everything you learned in that first call. And so it was really good that Aaron did a level set. You guys didn't all hear it on the uh, snippet, but he talked about uh, reference the first call and what was covered. I think um, another interesting thing that the AI is looking at here. So obviously... AI is busting them for, hey, no agenda, control a call, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a bunch of snippets that we share that he can jump in and and and, and look at with his counterparts doing a great job on that. But Aaron and I talked yesterday. He knows how to do a good agenda. He chose not to do it because this one started getting away from him. It's happened to me too. I get it. And he's like, I'm just going to go with the flow. But a couple of things. When you're in high velocity sales, we all know that time is money. And Replays IQ pattern matches to your most successful calls at this stage. And it says, hey, your, your actual optimal call length at this stage at your company at owner is 49 minutes. Aaron's call went an hour and 14 minutes. So if there's if we say all the other reasons that were mentioned aren't worth doing it, but, but by the way, I agree with all of them. I think they're worth doing. One is just Aaron's time. It's like, hey, if he had kept more control at the beginning, because the prospect did end up just starting going down their own agenda and shared a bunch of stuff that might not have been crucial to Aaron's uh, path. Now I'm going to step out of the replace IQ thing for a sec and just share my thoughts uh, because we've, we've literally coached thousands of reps at, at replays over, over the years. And we used to do it with humans, 24 great coaches. Now we do it with, with tech, but our most valuable asset is our time. And as a prospect, you want your, sales rep to respect that. And one way to do that is to ask you what you want to cover on the call and why you're here. Um, and the other is, you know, an analogy I like to use is when we go on a hike, we usually have a plan, right? We want to know like, where are the lookouts? If it's a brand new city we're in and we're going up mountain, we're like, you kind of want to get a lay of the land because you don't want to miss out on the important things that you care about. And you also care about your time. And as humans, we just want predictability and we want to know where we're going. So I think it's one of those things where it puts the prospect at ease if you do a really good agenda up front that is similar to you know what what Mark was sharing. Great, great stuff, um, and very cool to see the AI picking up a lot of the things that that Kyle and Mark uh, shared. There's a, a quick question, Dave, um, around this. I think a lot of people are interested in. You know this AI for for themselves and their teams. Um, the question was: um, Is all of this data just for post call, or are they any getting any guidance during the call? I think that's an interesting broader discussion, and would love everyone's take on that. Like, do you actually want your reps with a little something in their ear so they can't be fully present, or little notes popping up saying "Do this, do that"? Um, I would love everyone's take on that. Maybe Dave, we'll start with you. Yeah, I've got a very firm position on that. Uh, we get asked all the time if that's something we're building. 
And uh, we all know that there's things like Kaya that exists, right? And here, here's what I would say is it for everyone like the, 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 that's listening right now. And for all of us, like if you're doing a speech in front of a bunch of people, let's say, would you find it annoying if things just popped up as you're doing a speech? <laughs> like, how are you going to keep? Hey, you're doing bad. It just starts bleeping red. I can't even look at the. I can't even look at the. I haven't looked at one chat thing yet, right? So, but here's what I will say: um, We've learned because we've got a team of data scientists, PhDs, who have built just amazing predictive models. We found, I think, for the first time in the industry, that we can predict the outcome of the sales call with a pretty high ac accuracy, like 80% plus, just based on the transcript of what happened in the call. And we've done that because we ran thousands of calls through our model and we're able to pattern match to success. And, and so what we're gonna do with that is we will have something that's real time at one point that tells you if you're at the very end of the call, if, you've lost, if you're about to lose a deal and there's 10 minutes left, It'll just pop up on the screen. It'll tell you the one thing why, the one thing. So as a rep, you'll expect it. You'll want to know it. And if you're losing it, it might be like, hey, you just really didn't uncover exactly what your prospect is wanting to hear about that 5% service fee objection. That's it. So that's how I think about it. As much as I'm not a huge fan of stuff popping up on the screen, I think if there's a chance to save a deal in, like I was on a call the other day, it, it took a left turn. I didn't know why. And I sent it through Replays IQ and it told me why. I sent it to a couple of people I respect on our team, coaches. Oh, I respect our whole team, but I mean, sales coaches on our team. And it said the same thing as Replays IQ. But had had there been a little icon that told me 10 minutes before the end of the call, what I learned later, I would have used that. So th those are my thoughts on it. I'm aligned. I, I'm, I think it would could be a distraction. And also, it's not always going to be accurate. If, if you have like a co-pilot going the whole time, <clears throat> I think the important thing to be uh, transparent about is like, you know, if Mark and I sat down and, and, and scored a call soup to nuts across 130 categories, do we think we would do that more accurately than AI? Pro probably. I would probably still uh, rather do it myself. But the scale of using a tool is just such an advantage that you're you're willing to take hey it's like 90 percent pretty awesome and i can get that for all of these calls so having a co-pilot running at 80 percent or 90 percent accuracy the value might be more challenging there because of the the distraction effect versus if it's if it's like a post-mortem type situation um mm. so I'm, I'm aligned with with you there dave people don't use in call prompts they don't use it. Dead simple, done. It's a sounds like a great idea. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I've looked at a bunch of those tools. I, I I also was not sold on a model working at the level that you would need in real yeah. time. Yeah. It's like being on a date and somebody behind you is whispering in your ear what to say next to the person so that they like, you know, you know, if things continue to the next level. It that that that's never going to work because then you're not engaged with the person you're actually on the date with and you back everything backfires the advice backfires because people can tell you're not engaged it just doesn't work i think dave's example is perfect on, on this webinar dave you can't be popping these windows up and be fully alert and like look at all the questions you know it's, it's, it's too much too much going on people would yeah. know um so um one uh, one question dave and then we'll move on to the the final one which is uh Always exciting, get some objections and everyone loves pricing discussions, of course. Um, uh, question is, does it pattern match to all the sales calls or do we train it against our company's calls specifically only, or is it both? Both. So because our model has ingested like thousands of hours of calls, um, all of that data is in there. But what we, we found very, very quickly is that if we have a, prospect who just rolled out MedPick training or Challenger or Jay Barrows or whatever, they want to look at those triggers and they want to track those triggers. Of course they do. And also there's, yes, sales of sales, but there's always nuance when it comes to the buyer journey with each individual prospect. So 
we spend the first four weeks training our model to their specific nuances. They just roll out med pick, boom, we do those triggers. Um, if they've got, um, actually on Mark's team, he had three new slides he wanted the team to review. And he's like, I don't know if they're doing it well or not. I don't have time to review it. So our AI went in and trained the model on what great looks like in presenting each of those slides. It looked at three or four skills per slide. And boom, Mark could just go in at the end of the day and say, I see exactly how the team did on those. So yeah, it, we found it's crucial that we not only have the, the data layer, of course, of the thousands of calls that we've already had, SMB mid-market enterprise and BDR calls as well, but that we we tune the model for, for our prospect. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's super critical. Just like this this call, that's why we teed it out very specifically. This is SMB. This is high velocity. We'd be giving very different coaching and feedback on how to handle different parts of this if we were talking about selling a big enterprise you know, deal to a director of IT, right? It's all contextual. And that's what models, AI models allow you uh, to do in a, a really interesting way. Um, all right, pricing, always a tough one. Uh, let's uh, tee up a few highlights from... Uh, Aaron's pricing discussion. All right. I had four highlights I was going to play here, but we're running low on time. So I'm just going to play Aaron's response. But to set it up, he nailed pricing. Did great. But then the prospect started getting hung up about this 5% service fee. And he's like, ah, this is just going to show up on the in on, on every receipt. And it just doesn't feel like I can justify that. I'm already a high cost provider. Um, like they, their pizzas are amazing quality, but they're the highest in town already in terms of price. Let's have a quick listen to how Aaron responds to that. So everything you just said is why the 5% service fee doesn't matter. Because people don't care. Like a few people will care. Like you might get the random person that's like, I don't know, the curmud curmudgeon, you know, guy that's been around the, the town forever or whatever. I'm not saying you would never get a complaint. Um, and I know you don't want any phone orders, but for the few people that do care, like those are people that can call and place an order if they really want to and just come pay cash, right? Um, people have been so conditioned to paying such high service fees to order food online now that the 5% service fee actually ends up just being quite reasonable. And it doesn't end up being a sticking point for us. This isn't something that our customer support line is dealing with, like getting people calling in complaining about it. We don't have restaurants um, leaving working with owner over the 5% service fee. Um, it is very interesting because it's a common concern. Like I know, you know, the restaurant owner is like, I don't know, a little weird about the 5% service fee. Uh, and then what ends up happening, like in Metro Pizza instance, uh, for example, they didn't have service fees before um, they were working with us. They worked with us. They do have a service fee now. Their sales actually just went up. Um, and that's because they were just providing a better online ordering experience uh, with the loyalty and with the mobile app and, and all this stuff. So people really care more about like how easy it is, you know, to actually order from you. And then when they get... We'll stop it there. Awesome. Uh, Mark, let's go for you first. Uh, first feedback. Yeah, the... the number one rule that I give people on objections is the objection is never the objection. And so any objection you get, your your knee-jerk response should be for clarification. And so you kind of went directly into overcoming it versus clarifying it. And here's a second like ninja level move. Ask the customer if they can solve their own problem. So I'd swap it around and be like, oh, so the 5% sounds like that might be a problem. Like, how could you see that? not be a problem for you or what could you do like what would you do with your customers to get them comfortable with it and give them a chance to solve their own problems a lot of times people will talk themselves out of their own objections if you give them a chance to but i loved your transparency of like hey i'm not saying you're not going to get complaints it does happen some some people are buttheads and they don't want to pay anymore so totally get that and then the last bit of coaching is is the longer that you spend overcoming or handling a objection the more ner nervous it makes you look about the objection and the more weight the objection takes on. You're giving so, the objection energy. That's yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. right. Love that. That's a much better way to put it. Thank you, Kyle. And so, yeah, don't, don't, I would have cut that down by like 75% 
and let them give them a chance to solve it and just be like, yeah, it's not really a problem. Actually, you know, in the last month I asked our service team, like how many uh, complaints they've gotten on this and they've gotten like three and we've gotten like 15,000 tickets in. So it's not really an issue, but uh, that's, that my, that's my coaching. Yep. Good stuff. So related point, we want to treat objections as invitations instead of an objection being something standing in our way, we have an ob the obstacle is the way mindset pulled from our guy, Ryan holiday. And so you want to steer into it and use that as an opportunity to learn more. And so what was missing there's questions, basically oh, I'm concerned about the 5%. People are going to be upset. Uh, this is like another Josh Braun thing. Oh, interesting. So you think your customers will be really upset about the 5% fee? And going, I'm I'm specifically using a questioning tone there with my tone raising at the end because I'm trying to bring uncertainty to that topic and then just let them fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, it's mirroring. I'm just saying back to the prospect what they said to me and just like give them more airtime to like talk themselves through it. Because if you use that questioning tone, so you're thinking a lot of your customers will have a problem with this? Like Ooh. the questioning tone, they're going to fill it in like, well, I mean, no, not a lot, but, you know, a couple, I mean, it's going to be like, you know, we've got some curmudgeons and, but I, I don't know if that's actually that big a deal. Like oftentimes if you give the customer space to talk, talk it through, um, they'll sort of backtrack and then you can ask one more clarifying question. Um, a good one in, in this specific situation. And so, you know, if there's a handful of 5% complaints each month, but you're making like. 10 grand more in delivery volume direct. Is that a, is that a fair trade-off for you? And, you know, like have them do cost benefit um, as a way to, to close with a question versus closing with an opinion. It's going to feel a little less, uh, it's going to feel less assertive. Uh, it's going to trigger less psychological reactants in the buyer, but it'll get the same job done. Great stuff. Great stuff. Dave, over to you for maybe some of your own personal thoughts and then we'll uh, see what AI says. Yeah, for sure. Well, sure. If I start with my my personal thoughts, it's that uh, if you guys had heard the rest of uh, how Aaron handled the pricing discussion, he nailed it. It, it, was the, it was that the one key objection about the 5% was around hometown owner knows all the locals really transparent about everything. It, it struck to his values that this thing, this 5% was sitting there. And I think there was an opportunity for Aaron to go in and appeal to his values, really be more empathetic rather than uh, almost jarring a little bit. And no offense, Aaron, but like, you know, you, you handled so many objections very, very well. This one, I think you actually could have asked for the deal if you'd overcome this. And I think the way over to come it, to overcome it is, you know, hey, let's talk about what's in it for your customers, like you talking to them, uh, your, you know, pizza shop customers on what this 5% brings them, you know, there's, it allows you to have a mobile app. So it's more convenient for them or et cetera, et cetera. So I think there was an opportunity there. What Replays IQ did was said exactly that. So um, we've got our scoring on pricing, which was like, yeah, overall pricing, you know, nailed it, nailed it, nailed it. And then there was uh, it, it showed up in the sort of lack of empathy area. But then we've got this feature where, you know, for the sales reps listening, you've got a call and you're like, man, I just wouldn't mind a second set of ears on that. I know I I feel that way once every probably week. <laughs> um, and you send it to your manager, but your manager's got a million things going on. So Replays IQ has this new system. It's called Yip Yap. And we're going to be rolling it out to the public in the next few weeks, yipyap.ai, but don't go there because the site's not even live yet. But we've trialed it with our current customers and this is what it looks like. So um, Aaron goes in, he's like, hey, I just couldn't overcome this 5% thing. Why is it? Replays IQ said, here's why. You know, Aaron missed the empathy. May have overlooked an opportunity to empathize with John's ethical stance. Lack of alternative solutions. There's no discussion over alternative fee solutions. No, So the coaching you just heard from Kyle and Mark the question is, can AI give that level of detail? Well, I haven't showed that to you until now, but yes, it can. And here's an example of that. And, and again, not that it's ever going to replace what Mark and Kyle are saying, um, exactly in terms of who they are and what they bring to the table. But the truth is, I would put this uh, solution right here up against 
the feedback of, of, of any coach out there. Um, and then it actually says, hey, try this next time. Here's a talk track. So uh, there's there's what Replays IQ says. And just so you know, this got sent to one of my best reps at Catalyst and her reaction was, when do I get my next one? And this is like, you know, giving a hungry man food, giving a thirsty woman water, like coachable reps want to be coached. And honestly, it's impossible for most sales letter leaders and managers to satiate the appetite and the, the thirst levels of, of coachable reps. That's one reason, like, you know, somebody said, don't be bang up on Aaron too much, but like Aaron being on this call tells you everything you need to know about Aaron as a rep, basically. And, you know, giving him this kind of feedback is something he probably takes seriously. He puts it into practice. He gets better, tries it on for himself, see if it works or not. And being able to do that is insane. Aaron, I would love to give you the floor too. You've been <laughs> an owner now for a while and you have the luxury of an incredible leader like Kyle who does coaching but then you also have this kind of AI co-pilot in, in replays. How has that kind of helped you um, progress in, in your career? And could you ever go back without having, you know, an AI coaching tool? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's all very interesting. Um, the thing I was thinking earlier when you were talking about how much time it takes to coach, like I do a call review with my frontline manager every week. Just We have it on the calendar, 45 minutes. We're able to dig into maybe 10 or 15 minutes of that call. Um, and so that takes a lot of time out of both of our calendars and the impact while positive is pretty minimal. Um, cause it's just such a small part of what I might've done in the previous week, as far as my overall, uh, workload goes. So Dave, what you were showing me yesterday, like how we can go in and find the specific things that we can look at and compare it to other people. Um, I know our leaders want us to get in gong and listen to stuff. So that that's, what's exciting to me about it. Um, that I can quickly go in and get what I actually think I need that can help me improve faster. Um, even with this objection thing, listening back to that is, um, hard for me because I'm realizing how bad I missed it. Um, if I could know that quicker, that's great. Right. Cause if we weren't, if I wasn't in a call review and I didn't go back and review it myself, I would have forgotten that I, you know, kind of screwed that one up. Right. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where my head's at on this. Yeah. Yeah. And Mark, Kyle, would you ever lead teams again without some sort of AI coaching platform? I mean, it depends on the price. I'd have to, you know, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't want a big renewal from Dave, uh, Scott. Let's do a live negotiation. That yeah, well fun. played. Let's, let's, well. let's renegotiate the contract live. <laughs> and then me and Mark will, will critique it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, of course. I think uh, anybody who's followed me knows my obsession with coaching and personal development. And this is an important part of that playbook. Like the more we can give to the reps to self-serve and get themselves better outside of the time that their managers can spend with them, the better. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really important piece of my playbook. I've been using replays since it was like a spreadsheet a year ago. And like that Dave and team given me daily scores. Like I would, because I was so committed to, uh, providing that feedback for the team, even before it was in this beautiful product, I, I was still willing to to make a big investment in it. So it's it's definitely a critical piece of my stack. Yeah, I, I like I said earlier, I think this is one of the more disruptive um, uh, pieces of technology I've seen in the last three, four, five years. I think uh, Gen AI is super cool, and it's kind of like a parlor trick. This is actually the one of the most practical applications of AI that that I've seen, and I think that Dave and his team have built like a huge moat because they've had so many years of doing this with humans and training the model. Uh, so yeah, like th this is like one of my required purchases when I go somewhere. Is um, I love coach, I love coaching. Uh, I know I don't do it nearly as much as uh, I need to, and this is a way to bridge that gap. I appreciate the feedback, guys. It means a lot to me. And Scott, you can see why I was very uh, particular about who I approached to be our early design partners. <laughs> I'd imagined a day like this may be happening a year and a half ago when I first talked to them. And here we are. Yeah. And these, these two take the profession more serious than anyone I, I know. So it's, it's, it's a massive thing to be able to have a solution that has hit uh, level of confidence that uh, passes these two and, and they're pushing it through the, their teams. But 
Awesome stuff. Well, thank you all, uh, Dave. I appreciate you, you know, letting us see under the the hood. It's obviously super exciting. A lot of people are thinking about AI and how to actually use it in go to markets. Uh, there's a lot of funny, uh, yeah, parlor tricks, as as Mark said, that look cool but might not actually move the needle. I think this is one of the first applications that that actually does. Um, and yeah, if you don't have Dave, Kyle, and Mark that can spend 12 hours a day reviewing all your coaching. This is certainly the, the next best thing. Um, and so appreciate you, Aaron. Appreciate you, Dave. And uh, Mark and Kyle, it looks like people are really beating the drum on this podcast. So you guys might have a new day job after this. <laughs> there you go. Let's do it. Awesome. Thanks, well, thanks, thank you, everyone. I uh, appreciate you all. Check out the GTM podcast, GTM newsletter. Um, and Mark's also doing a cool series with Pavilion, uh, similar to where he's going head to head with uh, AI again. So make sure everyone checks that out.